You can pray until you faint. But if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, Honey, I'm not going to get in the mess. Black Power Talks. I'm Dr. Matsumela Odom. My name is Dexter M. Lemwingu. Uhuru means freedom, and freedom is on our minds 24-7. On March 29, 2022, the California Reparations Task Force voted in a 5-4 split to limit eligibility for reparations to be determined by an individual being an African-American descendant of a chattel enslaved person or descendant of a free black person in the U.S., prior to the end of the 19th century. A previous amendment would have extended the California reparations plan to all of the 2.6 million African people living in California, with special consideration to those who descended from Africans enslaved in the U.S. The California Reparations Task Force was formed in 2021 in the wake of the international uprisings that followed the murder of George Floyd. The first statewide task force of its kind in the United States, the California Reparations Task Force was given the duty of establishing a way forward for reparations in the state. The March 29, 2022 vote narrowed their scope. The California Reparations Task Force is expected to release its full report in 2023. However, the study has already been done. In 1982, the African People's Socialist Party convened the first international tribunal on reparations in Brooklyn, New York. The verdict is that Africans in the U.S. are owed no less than $14 trillion in damages, or about $1 million per family. The African People's Socialist Party aimed to make reparations a household word by taking it out of the hands of the legislative and legal sector and giving it to the African working class. It has succeeded. Black Power Talks salutes the 40th anniversary of the Reparations Tribunal. Throughout 2022, we'll be presenting a series of episodes that explore the issues of reparations from an African internationalist perspective. Today's episode is part one in that series. On March 20th, 2022, I participated in a panel discussion entitled Make Wall Street Pay Reparations. The panel discussion was part of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement Convention. The Uhuru Solidarity Movement, USM, is an organization of white people in solidarity with African liberation. USM is an anti-colonial organization. One of their objectives is to organize for reparations to the African community. Masamela was joined on this panel by Yejide Oromila, president of the African National Women's Organization, Penny Hess, Chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Committee, and Jesse Neville, the USM Chair. Chairwoman Penny Hess provided an overview to the discussion. Citing the colonial mode of production, Penny Hess underscored the debt that is owed to African people and noted that reparations is not charity. Reparations is, in fact, a revolutionary demand. First of all, when we ask how much do we owe as the colonizer, as the white population, well, the fact is we owe everything. And that's why the African People's Socialist Party sees 
reparations as a revolutionary demand. It is not a favor. It is not something to make white people feel good because you can give a little donation here or there. But it's something that goes to the heart of the very essence of the the social system that we live in, which is colonialism as a mode of production, as Chairman O'Malley Ishitella has said. And one of the um, things that we have to do is to be able to take responsibility as white people, as the colonizers, as African internationalist colonizers, to, to be able to take responsibility for the history of the white population here and everybody in the world and and to be able to to say what it is that we have to do under the leadership of the African revolution to join with that and to go out and to win other white people. I just, you know, again, want to salute Chairman O'Malley Chatella's brilliant, brilliant struggle around this question of, of Russia and the Ukraine and to to take that on from the basis of colonialism, from the basis of an African and from the leadership of the African nation united as one colonized people on the inside of Africa and and first forcibly dispersed around the world. And that, that is just, you know, just extremely powerful. Uh, and, And it's so scientific that we know that it is our responsibility to to get out this truth about the U.S. colonial imperialist war against Russia and that we have to stand on the side of the anti-colonial peoples on the planet Earth. Um, I, you know, the chairman has written that African people produced and reproduced life for white people for 600 years. And that is a, a statement that is incredibly, um, it, it's, it's moving, it's poignant. It, it's the absolute truth and, and putting it out in a way that white people have to hear that. That there's never, there's, there's never been a time in 600 years, either on the continent of Africa or here or in Brazil or the Caribbean or any place else where African people have been forcibly dispersed, where African people had had control, not only over their economy, over their life, over their society, but even over their children. The the babies that that are born um, are have been commodities for for this colonialism as the mode of production for capitalist colonialism. And I think that, um, you know, and and that that they have been produced, they have produced and reproduced life for us and white people have been the power, the, um, the, the dominant force in unity, generally speaking, throughout our history with our own ruling class, despite the fact that some white people might have contradictions with the ruling class, the ultimate, the ultimate reality is that, that um, white people are in unity with sitting on this pedestal of the uh, colonial um, peoples uh, on, on the backs of, of African people, indigenous people and oppressed peoples around the world. And that, you know, everything that we have, the chairman says, every dream and aspiration, everything that we have comes at the expense of the blood, the suffering, the exploitation, the resources, the, you know, the, the people um, and, and children of African people, indigenous people and oppressed people on this planet. And that we have to come to terms with that reality. And the chairman has produced science to show that and that this is the responsibility that we have to take it on. So what do we owe? We owe everything. Um, how did Wall Street start and all, um, all of the uh, stock exchanges of the world, they started with the kidnapping of African people and the theft and kidnapping of African human beings, turning them into commodities for sale um, as 
items to be sold around the world and forced labor. You know, just this is this is the reality of, of our life and the genocide against the indigenous people here. So one of the things that the African People's Socialist Party, the office of the chairman and the Department of Agiprop and Director Kile that the chairman is, was just talking about earlier is is working to do right now is to make sure that the ideas of the chairman are, are being credited, that responsibilities is being taken to acknowledge where these things are coming from. Because if you have heard about the term reparations, and if you have heard the term colonialism, this is because of Chairman O'Malley and Chatella putting this out, struggling, everything about it from the party's institutions on the ground to every struggle and demonstration to every everything from the struggle to free dusty wood smash colonial violence goes back to educate the people the masses of african people and the people on the planet that every single struggle every single front of life of african people has to lead to the struggle to destroy colonial capitalism, colonialism as mode of production once and for all, and African people have to be free and self-determining, self-governing. And this is what the African People's Socialist Party is doing in practice. It is governing itself. And so, you know, we have this narrative, the white narrative, what we learn in school and everywhere else is that white people came here to the United States uh, escaping oppression and poverty in Europe and that the there is this narrative that the overall economy of both Europe and the United States in particular was sound it was positive it was a good thing it was full of of, of refugees from a cruel Europe it was for freedom seeking and um, religious freedom, you know, all of this kind of thing that white people were seeking and coming here. They were good people. They, um, they, you know, they worked hard. They farmed, they cleared the land, you know, all of the, all of this narrative, this lie of the colonizer and that, you know, it, that the U S economy was, was a good thing, um, fueled by the work of good white people, but it had a few bad spots in it and places where there was slavery as an anomaly. This is, this is what you learn. And, and you know, in many cases and for many years, the whole question of the enslavement of African people wasn't even really taught in the schools at all. And we also learn that the enslavement of African people was isolated to the South, to the Southern states, and that the Northern states is where the good white people who supported the freedom for African people are. And we know that that is a complete lie because when white workers in New York City were drafted to fight on the side of the union, um, they assaulted and killed African people. They had a huge riot, mobs of white people burning down. They burned down an African orphanage in New York City. Um, and you know they, they killed Africans and, and lynched them. And you know, it's really clear that the the civil war was about the sector, about which sector of the bourgeoisie would control the colonial mode of production. Um, it was, you know, which one? It was it was a gentleman's war, and I think it's really interesting fact, you know, because it was it was united over. The, ex, the colonial domination of African people, and it was united over the genocide against the indigenous people. You know, there's there's a, a point that I've read that in fact, 220 civil war generals on both, that's, you know, from the North side and the, and, and the, the Southern, the Confederacy served at the Jefferson Barracks here in, um, over, you know, over a period of time here in St. Louis, where the um, Jefferson Barracks was the staging ground for the genocidal war against the indigenous people. So they rode their horses all the way to California and to the north and to 
you know, all over the Southwest and everything. And so this is where they all had unity. And some of them went to the North, like Ulysses Grant and William T. Sherman and Philip Sheridan and Confederate generals like Robert E. Lee and, and others were also there as well. So they had unity with the genocide against the indigenous people. That's where they, they learned to um, you know, commit this violence. And they had unity that, you know, that African people would be, would be totally colonized and that, um, you know, and that all the white settlers everywhere that they went were, you know, were, were there to colonize, to steal the resources and to oppress the people. And so this is, you know, this brings us to not only the question of reparations and colonialism overall, but to the chairman's incredibly dialectical understanding of colonialism as the means of production, that everything that African people have done, um, have been forced to do, has created the economic and political basis for us as white people and for the United States and Europe to exist, to have incredible wealth and to, um, you know, to be able to, to dominate and rule the world. And even seeing this carried out in terms of what the U.S. is doing every single day in the U.S. wars, U.S. violence against the people on the planet Earth and what we see the U.S. taking on against um, the people of Russia today using the Ukraine as, as a tool to attack Russia. So, you know, I just wanted to say this and that it is extremely powerful, historical, and really urgent that we as white people take this on, take on this call to work like hell in this period, to go in to the white community, to go everywhere, to penetrate it all, to win other white people, to stand on the forward side of history. African people are gonna win either way, but we have the ability to, to be a fighting force and to, you know, and to raise up beyond what it is, our own self-interest, our bellies, our pocketbooks that we, that we live with, um, you know, that, that we've wallowed in for, for centuries. We have the ability to join humanity, to be part of a world without war, without oppression, without parasitism, without the blood sucking violence that the system puts us in a relationship to every single day as the beneficiaries of it. So I just want to say that and say Uhuru, unity through reparations. That was Penny Hess, chairwoman of the African People's Solidarity Community. You are listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. This is episode one of a year-long series on reparations. Today's episode is entitled, Make Wall Street Pay Reparations. Penny was followed by a very own Dr. Masimela Odom. In his talk, entitled Make Bank of America Pay Reparations, Masimela spoke on the history of Wall Street and the colonial enslavement of African people. Wall Street, Masimela notes, was literally built by Africans and functioned as a slave auction block for almost 150 years before the establishment of the stock exchange. This established a colonial mode of production that the Bank of America has followed to make it one of the wealthiest banks in the United States. So in 1991, uh, while while excavating for construction in Lower Manhattan, actually a government building at that, a borough of 419 Africans was found um, uh, on Wall Street. Historians suggest that as many as 20,000 Africans are actually buried uh, at Wall Street. New York City was one of the largest slave ports in North America. Uh, it had one of the largest uh, populations of enslaved people of any urban city in North America. And New York uh, remained a slave state well into the 19th century, as uh, Chairwoman Penny talked about, really defying this myth of some sort of north-south divide. So hear me out when I say that uh, Wall Street literally began with the theft and sale of African bodies. It's not a metaphor. This is the colonial mode of production. 
The first enslaved uh, Africans were trafficked to North America, uh, or were trafficked to New York City in 1626 by the Dutch West Indian Company, uh, which had already been in um, West Africa, where it set up its own depots known there as factories, where Africans were uh, imprisoned and then trafficked uh, across the Atlantic. Wall Street became the de facto slave trading port in Manhattan, which had uh, also been stolen from indigenous people. A long, a, a long wall was built in lower Manhattan through enslaved labor of African people to protect the Dutch and later on the English's stolen loot of material and human resources. In 1711, Wall Street became the official slave market, even though it had a function as the de facto slave market. And about 20% of New York's population were enslaved Africans. In 1741, uh, Africans organized a revolt against colonial slavery, uh, and at least 13 of them were burned at the stake in response to this revolt. Wall Street remained the primary slavery trading post in New York until 1762. On the eve of the colonial civil war known as the American Revolution, that was the, the, the end of it. However, this slave market was replaced by the stock exchange in the wake of the, uh, of the Revolutionary War, uh, 1792. Historian Stephanie Smallwood has described the colonial enslavement of African people as a process of alchemy, a process in which Africans were turned into gold. Manhattan and Wall Street was the epicenter of this genocidal system. The wealth of white America, the entire colonial capitalist system was built on the stolen indigenous land and stolen African labor. It was the in the harvest of the black bodies that U.S. economy and colonial capitalism was built. Chairman O'Malley Eschatella of the African People's Socialist Party argues Africans were primitive accumulation, you know, noting that what Marx termed primitive accumulation was what we understand as the colonial mode of production. Uh, um, it was that deadly assault, a European assault on Africa, North, North and South America, and Australia and the extinction and near decimation of whole peoples. It was the brutal rape of Asia and the Middle East and the uh, numerous internecine wars between European states battling for control of the slave trade and the colonies. It was the resultant growth in wealth that overturned European feudalism and ushered forth capitalism and the European nation. African people did not simply produce wealth of capitalism, it was the wealth of the U.S. There was no other commodity more valued uh, at the time of the Civil War than African people. At the lowest number, we can understand that they would have been uh, something like four four mil four billion dollars that that day's money. At the lowest number, uh, that would have been at least four trillion dollars um, uh, uh, today. The Bank of America rests on uh, the pedestal of African oppression. The Bank of America rose from the colonial mode of production. The Bank of America is the second largest bank in the, uh, uh, in the U.S. at this time and has accumulated $2.5 trillion in wealth, trillion with a T. While unemployment rates for Africans are rising, especially for African women uh, 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 and indigenous women, and we find it hard to increasingly simply feed our children. The head of the Bank of America, Brian Moynihan, makes $30.5 million per year. The Bank of America began as a California institution, the place where I stand right now or sit. California was stolen at gunpoint from Mexican and indigenous people by white North American settlers. It, Bank of America, uh, has uh, uh, has never come, well, it has never come as a surprise to people that the gold that was um, found in California just a year after this colonial assault, uh, 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 th th that gold was found just a year after this colonial assault against Mexico and against California. 
This assault claimed the lives of at least 100,000 indigenous people, at least. And I say at least because of the fact that the early laws in occupied California did not forbade the murder of indigenous people. So we even don't really know the, the full extent. Thousands of Mexican people had their land stripped from them and they themselves deported. The Bank of America has its origins as a depot for the loot uh, stolen by American settlers in California and Nevada. Whether it is the slave depots on the coast of Africa that filled the coffers of European wealth, uh, Wall Street or the Bank of America, this is the same colonial mode of production. Other predecessors for the Bank of America, such as the Bank of the Metropolis, Boatman Savings Institution, and the Southern Bank of St. Louis made their money through the institution of colonial slavery. Bank of America and the housing industry. In California, the Bank of America built this wealth on the colonial housing industry, right? This is an industry in which uh, as many as 70% of white people own homes, fewer than 30% of African people own homes, and African people own homes in places that are dilapidated, places with th that are under resources, places that actually oftentimes generate negative equity. It has been the primary way through which a white uh, uh, the white population of California has generated its wealth. Yet with over 400 branches uh, in the 1960s, uh, for example, uh, Africans had no other place uh, 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 to, put, to, to put their money with, of course, the defeat of the Garvey movement being ripped away from us and we having our, no self-sustaining institutions of ourselves, right? This is no reason why, it, uh, why on average it suggests that the average white person in, in the U.S. has $135,000, $135,000 in wealth, whereas uh, the Africans, uh, ball players, movie actors included, uh, only have $9,500 of wealth. And that African women who go to college make less money than white men who drop out of high school. This is colonialism. In the 1960s, it's for this reason that Bank of America, which was the largest institution uh, period in California with 29,000 employees, uh, uh, was struggled against by civil rights activists then. H however, at that moment of struggle, the fight against Bank of America was led by the demands of the African middle class. They were anti-racist demands, not anti-colonial demands. Instead of demanding reparations, and African community control of the banking system, organizers demanded inclusion, jobs, training programs, and anti-racist legislation. The struggle uh, uh, matured to the uh, 1970s during the anti-apartheid movement in which uh, once again, the Bank of, of, of America was targeted and, and identified. Now the interesting thing is that in the 1950s, a, a, a banking law was passed that did not allow for uh, banks in California to banks to go outside of the states that they were at. So what happened was uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, at least $200 million of 1960s money, which would be uh, uh, probably in the billions of dollars was invested into uh, apartheid uh, South Africa. This becomes directly identified with the colonial mode of production here in North America because of the fact that it was found that in places like South Los Angeles, where a, a plurality of the people putting their money into the banks were African, indigenous, and Asian, 90% uh, of the investment had been going into the uh, white communities. Now, I, as I move ahead a little bit, some of these numbers were like, said, for example, in the West Adams area, seven, it was 70% African, 13% uh, Latino, 8% uh, Asian. There was only a per capita lending of $1.83. Meanwhile, in Pacific Palisades, 95% white, Bank of America lent per capita $128 per person. So, so, so it's very clear to African activists at that time that this was um, a, a part of a larger system of colonial capitalism. 
This brings us to the importance of the campaign that we have now. We know that the Bank of America is a driving force for gentrification, is a driving force for the occupation of our communities, for for, uh, for, for mass imprisonment of African people. But it's only through uh, organizations that we are going to overturn uh, this system of uh, parasitic colonial capitalism. The only answer to this long history of white power uh, that I have identified with you all right now yeah, is to make Bank of America pay reparations and to get on the right side of history. That was Master Miller Odom. An excerpt of this talk can also be found in the May 2022 Burning Spear newspaper. You are listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. This is episode one of a year-long series on reparations. Today's episode is entitled, Make Wall Street Pay Reparations. You can pray until you faint, but if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, honey, I'm not going to get in the mess.
I was followed by Yesterday on Mila, president of the African National Women's Organization, the only revolutionary organization made up entirely of working class African women. President Yesterday spoke of colonial enslavement's exploitation of African women's ability to produce life and wealth. She related it to the contemporary taking of African children and unmothering of African women by the colonial state. She also discussed the interesting comparison of Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. So I think it's really important. Comment by Samela had used the word trafficked. <laughs> and I think that was a really important word to use because I don't really hear that, hear that term used as much when it comes to the enslavement of African people, the kidnapping of African people. I think it's really important because today the term traffic is used for um, you know, trafficking young girls across wherever, the sex, sex trafficking, that's pretty much where it's mostly used, trafficking children, trafficking women. And I think that, you know, we have to really see that correlation between the trafficking of human beings tied directly to the colonial mode of production, which was the enslavement of African people. And the system was built on the trafficking of human beings so that now that when we see it, um, and now that we see that it's a problem, <laughs> you know, that we recognize that the, the system itself is trafficking in the system is the basis of the system, that the movement and sale of human beings, for whatever reason, is the basis uh, for capitalist colonialism. And until colonial capitalism, and until the system is destroyed, we're going to see um, various iterations of trafficking of human bodies, and particularly the exploitation of African women and children. Uh, within that system of exploitation. So I just really wanted to pinpoint that because that was really um, important to note. And the topic of making Wall Street pay reparations, you know, it's really important to say that, you know, on these auction blocks in Wall Street and other places that were heavy pores for where African people were um, were trafficked to and sold off from, that the, the African woman also representing the actual production of human beings um, that were uh, enslaved and our children who were actually auctioned off from us really is um, a testimony to just the experiences of African women uh, within the context of capitalist, colonial capitalism. And, and even today, as the African National Women's Organization has, a, has a, a campaign called the Red CPS, really seeing that correlation between the foundation of colonial capitalism and the sale of human bodies and the taking of African children and unmothering African parents, um, um, unparenting African people by the stealing of their children. And so, you know, there's so many different correlations that we see within the context of colonial capitalism, right? Like there's so many things that are happening within the scope of, of this system that has not ended. You know, we, we may think that these auction blocks are gone, but they're still here. They're here in the form of the Department of Health and Human Services and foster care system. They're here. In the in the in the um in the form of prisons, they're here in the form of schools. They're here in the form of every single entity that was developed as a um, as a structure of policy and containment that represents the interests of the white ruling class. And so the auction blocks have moved from Wall Street, but are in every single city. Have policy that has backed it up and justifies the taking of human children of of, um, of children. Um, particularly major, majority African children in the United States, as um, them seeing our best interests in mind and, and keeping our best interests in mind, hoping that we can rescue children from bad situations. But the bad situation is always the colonial state, never um, never the African community. And so I just, um, I think that when we talk about Wall Street and the, uh, and the slave courts and the courts where African people were taken from, that we see that, the way that it was manipulated and changed to things that are actually happening still today is really important. And that we can't disconnect these entities and these departments um, that claim whatever is claiming to be in the, you know, control safety and things like that, that never, never, never has these entities had the, um, had the interest of African people in mind. As a matter of fact, it, 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 uh, it actually is there to contain and control the oppressed populations in this country. I think it's really also important that 
to talk about like the history of the of New York too, and just really looking at some of the players that were there and, and the and the burgeoning women's suffrage movement and the implications that I had on not only what was happening there in terms of using African women as the faces of some issues, but also um, you know, using their position um, of white women and white men both using their position to really catapult themselves off of the backs of enslaved Africans through the abolition movement and things like that. I wrote a, a piece called, um, it was Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, uh, Dialectical, sorry, um, mi- Philosophical Idealism versus Historical Materialism. And I draw a correlation between these two women who did exist at the same time in history. And people often don't really realize that it, that like these two women were in different places and they weren't interacting and they didn't talk with it. And, like there was no interaction between these two women. I thought it was really important to highlight um, them because they represented two stances, two ways of organizing, two ways of getting what they needed to ensure that the that African people were were uh, going to get what they needed. You know, but what, what their interests represented. And I thought it was important to say that um, that this a lot of their organizing happened in New York. A lot of what they were doing were happening in New York, where Wall Street is, where there is currently a building over the African burial ground, and where there is currently a little monument in that building. I've been to it. <laughs> that kind of says that there was some Africans that they had to build over to, to accomplish this building. And I wanted to raise these two because um, there's often um, this narrative around Sojourner Truth that, you know, has her talking in this old timey Southern dialect, you know, um, and this one piece that she, that was recorded was Ain't I a Woman, which of course she would never speak like that because she was raised in the, in the North. Um, And that really ties into what Comrade Penny was saying in terms of like, people always saw this, this, this division or the, the narrative around it was that the slave holding South was the bad people in the North was where African people had, um, freedom, but th- there was uh, uh, one of the largest populations in the urban city where uh, of African enslaved people was in New York City. And Sojourner Truth was at this conference of white women. And exactly, it was one of the, um, one of the conferences that Sojourner was speaking at uh, was a conference of white women. Uh, Sojourner had been somebody um, who had escaped her own slavery by just um, leaving. She had been an advocate who has used the court system to get her son back out of the slaveholding South because he was sold down there illegally. Um, she had been somebody who had been, um, you know, advocating for herself and her family and just her, the interest of, of, of Black people. And um, these white women saw that and thought that she would be a very good representative to speak at their conference. And uh, she gave a speech that was um, that, you know, was transformed into the Southern vernacular to kind of, I guess, white um, uh, Southernize the fact that there was slavery um, as opposed to saying, you know, saying, uh, recording um, what she said in her actual vernacular. And um, and so here she is talking about, "Am am I not a woman? And she's laying out things like, um, don't I, am I not a woman? Don't I deserve to get a, a, a cover over rainwater when I step out of a carriage? Don't I, I work just as hard as any man, am I not a woman? Things like that. And she's speaking to an audience of white women who um, who have, who use her in their house, right? Like she, who has other black women, African women in their homes, taking care of the children of their household. She's actually, um, she's speaking to an audience of women who may be abolitionists, but they also benefit from their relationship to, they also benefit as uh, on the pedestal of of colonial capitalism and uh, take uh, this woman as an example to other African women and uh, use her along with others like Harriet Tubman to accomplish their goal to say that women need rights. And it was really important um, to identify her as they always have, like white women always have, used the interests of African people, try to divide the interests of African women against African men 
um, and uh, use this as a position for their own, because obviously white women who benefit were the enslavers, were the assaulters, who were the, the violent people who were responsible for enslaving and capturing and kidnapping African people who actually ben who benefited from all of it, could not rest in their own laurels when it came to you know, fighting for equality and justice. They had to use the voices and the bodies of African people and of African women to get their point of cost in order to, to make it seem like women share the same experience. And of course, the party has already explained that there is no such thing as women in general, that women are not all the same, and particularly African women and uh, colonizer white women are also not the same. And we are fighting for the very different interests and our interest is to be free of uh, colonial capitalism and not to be dominated by anybody else and not to have our voices or our bodies or our children's bodies or our people's bodies used uh, against us. And so, and then I just wanna also raise like Harriet Tubman who was somebody who actually went, she was a warrior, a general. She braved uh, incredible danger, went back to the Southern states to rescue hundreds of people out of enslavement, she led uh, military brigades like, in, in actual military actions and rescued hundreds of people. She was engaged in fighting against um, uh, uh, the, in the uh, Union Civil War. She was um, an active participant. She believed that every single thing was owed to African people. And even when she was speaking at these conferences and even when she um, was fighting in uh, in these wars on the on the side of the union. She was still making struggle to make sure that African people got every single thing that they needed. And um, until her death, until her death, she was um, she was died in uh, in a home that she uh, pushed for, recruited for, organized for, raised money for. It's a home indigent uh, African people. I just think that's really important because here we have. As someone who was a um, two women who were incredibly powerful and important, but whose image one had been used for feminist propaganda, the other one is beloved by um, by all African people for all of her incredible work, and and it's all happened in New York. The, the, their whole strategy, and they all died. They both died in New York in, in poverty. So that and, and while being used um, by um, you know, white colonizers to for whatever their efforts are in terms of women's rights and things like that. Our struggle, though, has never um, been accommodated. We have not won the freedom and um, liberation that we deserve because African women um, uh, have at some time of time been sideswiped by this bourgeois idea of women in general. And so our responsibility, reason that and will exist is to help us understand and to help us give voice to the African working class women fighting against all of the conditions that are put forth by colonial capitalism and uh, uh, creates a way for us to, to actually build a worldwide revolutionary uh, organization of African women who are destroying the concept and, and, story, and destroying not just the concept, but the entire um, structure under which uh, we continue to be uh, specifically oppressed. and. You know, it just, it's just incredibly um, courageous African people and African women who have laid the groundwork for us to, to, to do this work. And it's an incredible, courageous African, uh, uh, like the chairman who has said that we are not yet free and I'm going to do everything possible to create the institutions like the African National Women's Organization and other institutions of the party that will represent the interests, but also fight for every single thing that we are owed. So, um, you know, we are not yet free. Uh, we are fighting. We are building organization. We are um, struggling against the same rotten, dirty social system of colonial capitalism that takes our children and um, uh, criminalizes African people, and we won't stop. So, uhuru. That was President Yejide Ormila. You can find her writings on Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth at theburningspirit.com and annualuhuru.org. You can also learn more about their arrest CPS campaign and their Black Mothers March on the White House being organized May 8, 2022 at annualuhuru.org. You have been listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. 
Today, we discussed Make Wall Street Pay Reparations in part one of a year-long series on reparations. Our theme song, Get Up and Do Something, was written and performed by Alike and Goma. Thanks to the Black Power Talk radio show's production, research, and promotions team, including Jaja Robinson, Empress Livewire, and a hipster panda. Switching it up a little bit today, we'll end with another song by Aliki and Goma titled Make the Struggle, featuring Ella Baker, off Aliki's 2020 album, Freedom in the Mix. Uhuru. A little boy on the streets of Norfolk called me a nigger. I struck him back. Thank you.